This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Click the link in the description or go to surfshark.deal slash hell to get 85% off of Surfshark for two years plus an additional three months for free. Let me tell you a story about change and innovation and one man's mission to save the world. Growing up, Louis Cipher was like any other Canadian boy. Poverty, famine, and conflict minerals were the last things on his mind. He was too busy thinking about math, food, <laughs> and sport. This all changed one day when he heard on the news about an Eritrean boy who bravely fought against child labor in his country. The story lit a fire in young Lewis, who from that moment on made it his mission to be on the news for that too. He went on to found the Weir and Hell Foundation to fight child poverty, and now he's done more than poor what's-his-name ever could. Lewis saw that the problem with traditional charities was that they weren't operated like businesses. Realizing that there had to be a better way, he traveled to developing countries and partnered with the most respected members of these communities, the resource extraction companies operating in the area. Now, thanks to Lewis's innovative fusion of charity and business, kids in North America can know they're helping to stimulate the economies of poorer countries whenever they buy their favorite products from the Gorm Coal and Petroleum Company. I first got involved with the We Are in Hell Foundation all the way back in high school, and I've been right here saving the world with them ever since. We do just so much amazing work with um, schools and wells and uh, I think we're still giving them goats. But most importantly of all, they helped me. A shy kid with braces, acne, and a twisted sense of humor that most people just weren't smart enough to understand at the time feel like I'd finally found a place where I belonged. And thanks to the work we've done, tens of thousands of kids all over the first world now think that that's what activism is all about. And none of this would be possible without the amazing, generous companies who've donated to us out of the goodness of their hearts, including Surfshark VPN. As anyone who's donated large sums of money to the We Are In Hell Foundation knows, online security is extremely important. Surfshark creates a private internet connection for you that protects your online activity from hackers, trackers, and your ISP, both at home and on the go. Not only that, but for those of you who aren't generous enough to afford to take volunteer trips to any of the We're in Hell Foundation's luxury resorts in developing countries, Surfshark is the next best thing. Surfshark allows you to change your location to access region-locked content and is the only premium commercial VPN with servers in over 100 countries. And they're offering a special deal for Black Friday slash the holiday period. Right now, if you click the link in the description or go to surfshark.deals slash hell or use the promo code weirinhell at checkout, you'll get 85% off for two years plus an additional three months for free. But that's not all. As part of this partnership, the We're in Hell Foundation is proud to announce for the very first time that we will be expanding our work in developing countries to break the cycle of poverty and stimulate the economy with our schools teaching young people to be online political content creators. So click that link in the description to get Surfshark and lift a young person out of poverty and onto a debate panel. Hey everyone, since the season tis almost upon us, I thought that this month I'd talk about charities and why they're evil. Well, maybe not evil per se. There absolutely are charities that do super important work, and even the less good ones are, for the most part, staffed by very, very good people who are sincerely trying to help. That said, I'm going to try to make the case that there are problems with the ways that most charities operate that can't be fixed without changing things on a fundamental level. Also, and this is just a lot more fun to talk about, some of them are kind of As a bit of a case study, I'm going to look at one charity that's, uh, controversial? Can I say allegedly evil? Let's go with Embattled. 
In this video, I'm gonna talk about the We Charity and the problem with NGOs. What do you need to assuage your guilt? Is it medicine or empty gestures? Keep your sympathies all to yourself and exchange them later for social favors. So there's a pretty strong chance that the We Charity doesn't mean anything to about 93% of the people watching this, and that's because they're a Canadian charity. That's right, you pervs. I'm going to talk about Canadian politics in this video. So strap the fuck in and please, 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 please don't close this window. I promise it's going to get weird. Like, I cannot stress enough how batshit some of the things that this charity is accused of doing are. Also, like. They do operate a lot outside of Canada too, with massive events in America and England especially, but as far as I've seen, people in those countries don't seem to have any idea who they are, which is pretty on brand for anything that Canadians claim is internationally successful. It's like how people will say how the tragically hip were internationally renowned and like, yeah, New Orleans is sinking is a banger, but... Mm. So, to catch everyone up, most basically, the We Charity is a massive children's charity here in Canada run by Craig and Mark Kielberger, two brothers who look like if someone designed clothing store mannequins that could feel pain. The We Charity was originally called Free the Children when they started, focusing specifically on fighting child labor through, like, conducting raids on sweatshops. But Eventually, they realized that that wasn't very effective and instead moved to a more holistic approach, as well as a name that makes them much harder to research. They mostly operate in poorer countries where they do a little bit of everything, building schools, digging wells, improving infrastructure, providing medicine, and creating jobs, or as they would put it, breaking the cycle of poverty. On paper, that all sounds pretty good, right? But there's so much more to it than that. The Weed Charity has been alleged to have done basically every sketchy thing that you could imagine a children's charity doing. Lying to donors, misappropriating funds, mistreating workers, child abuse, going after journalists. Oh yeah, and also one guy claims that Mark personally held him at gunpoint and essentially tortured him in order to get him to sign a fraudulent confession which would later be used to blackmail him. You know, charity stuff. Now, a quick disclaimer here. Normally, when I make these videos, I do all my own research and try to be very thorough. For this one, I tried to do that and then begrudgingly listen to a podcast that is about this subject called White Saviors by Candleland. And like, they cover everything I was going to and a lot more and spoke to tons of people who were involved. Uh, I think I take my analysis in a different direction and they aren't the only source I used here, but they are the main one. I bring this up for two reasons. One, this is a condensed version of a lot of the stuff that they go over, so if you're interested in learning more, you can check them out, link in the description. And two, the We Charity is very litigious and has filed multiple defamation suits against that podcast, as they do with any outlet that is critical of them. And like, with the White Savior suit, they not only sued the company that produced it, but also named everyone involved in the production, seemingly kind of just at any level, as defendants. This is all to say that throughout this video, you're going to hear the word allegedly a lot, and that's why. It hasn't been within the scope of this project to fully investigate everything myself, and so I'm relying on things that other people have reported, which seem credible to me, but the Wee Charity definitely would 
disagree. Um, it's just not within my pay grade to determine what's true or not in some of those cases. And so I've tried to leave some of the more ambiguous stuff out. To summarize, please, please don't sue me. Anyways, the thing that most Canadians are probably most familiar with the charity for is the WE scandal that broke in 2020. I'm just gonna get the Canadian politics stuff out of the way right now, and then I promise that'll be it, and also I'll buy you all ice cream. So near the start of the pandemic, since a lot of young people were losing their summer jobs, Justin Trudeau introduced a program where kids who'd lost their jobs could make some money being paid to do community service. This was a massive project with a budget of almost a billion dollars, which the Trudeau government gave to the WE charity to handle without looking into any other organizations first. This raised some eyebrows, especially since Trudeau and his family had appeared at an awful lot of WE events before and after becoming Prime Minister. Now, there is a reasonable explanation for all this, which is that the WE charity is the biggest children's charity in the country, and so since they've had tons of politicians and celebrities at these events, it's not at all out of character for Justin Trudeau to be there, since we're talking about a man who loves photo ops so much that he shows up to climate change marches to, I guess, protest himself? Also, this program needed to be implemented as fast as possible, and so while I think there's definitely a case to be made for why they should have looked into other organizations, especially knowing what we know now, given Wee's massive organizational infrastructure and connections with schools across the country, they were genuinely a natural first pick for something like this. So while that story checks out, it was still a little fishy. Did we and Trudeau have any financial relationships that could make this a conflict of interest? Asked Trudeau's critics. No, replied the WE charity, lyingly. It came out that while it was true that everything that Trudeau and his family had done for WE prior to 2015 was unpaid, after he became prime minister, we super randomly, allegedly, began paying his mom and brother for speeches that they'd give, which they used to do for free. They also began sending his finance minister on luxury vacations and gave that minister's daughter a job. And also, weirdest of all, was that they gave Trudeau's wife a wellness podcast? Like, First Lady isn't really a title we use here, which is cool, I guess, but because of that, Wikipedia had her occupation listed as We Ambassador. <laughs> this stupid fake country. <laughs> when the scandal broke, Trudeau shut down the government to prevent investigations into it, which is fully just a thing he can do without it even really being that big of a deal. And then, in the end, his finance minister took the fall. So yeah, that's basically what happened and is also the most normal part of the story. Oh yeah, and also, the ice cream shop is closed. We're turning around and going to the exploration of the problems endemic to the non-profit industry store. They're open all night. To start, I want to look deeper into things, and so let's rewind a bit to where this whole controversy started. In the early Middle Ages, the first almshouses were established in Europe. These almshouses were shelters that provided housing to the poor, old, and sick, and like all charity at the time, they were run by religious organizations. Secular charitable organizations didn't begin in Europe until the Enlightenment, when the upper classes began getting involved in philanthropy through voluntary associations like gentlemen's clubs. These eventually resulted in the incorporated model of charity we know today, when the British captain Thomas Coram, appalled at how many orphans he was seeing in the streets of London, began the Foundling Hospital in 1741. Now, Let's skip forward a bit, and also to the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. In America, before the Civil War, charity was much more of an individual activity. 
This changed with industrialization and the social ills that came with it. These were generally organized by well-off community leaders and helped people that they thought were deserving. We're talking orphans, widows, maybe some disabled people, but only if you had like a really sad story. Very importantly, while these organizations would help a lot of people, and that's an amazing thing to do, their focus was on treating the symptoms of society's problems but never on the causes. For instance, they'd help the poor, but never advocate for things like higher wages. Then in the 1900s, things really took off as the first millionaire robber barons began establishing charitable foundations to give back to society while also shielding their money from taxes. Charities were a win-win situation for them. They could kill two birds with one stone-shaped cake, which they would then both have and eat. Sorry if that line didn't make any sense. Yesterday, I woke up and started my day at 11.30 p.m. These foundations would hire a lot of the same people who worked in the early charity movement, but one key difference was that while previous charities would focus on tangibly addressing an issue, these foundations were a lot more general. They'd be less focused on things like volunteering and more into researching policies and spreading awareness. For example, in 1914, when a group of miners were massacred by the Colorado militia for going on strike against Colorado Fuel and Iron, a company that proto-Bezos John D. Rockefeller owned 40% of, the Rockefeller Foundation began pushing the narrative that, of course, the plight of the individual worker is tragic, but the solution isn't a union, but the life-saving work that the Rockefeller Foundation is doing to alleviate the poverty that the people who work for us find themselves in for no particular reason. At the same time, they work to suppress any investigations or reporting on the massacre, claiming that the union was the real cause of the violence, and also sponsored speakers who'd tell the community things like, what killings, and no we didn't. Frederick Gates, one of the people running the foundation, said, quote, The danger is not the combination of capital. It is not the Mexican situation. It is the labor monopoly and the danger of the labor monopoly lies in its use of armed force, its organized and deliberate war on society. I like how he used the completely made up term labor monopoly for unions, while also referring to an actual monopoly as the combination of capital. Like, you can't do both of those things in the same sentence. But it wasn't all good. In 1916, charities came under attack when the U.S. Commission on Industrial Relations filed the Walsh Report, which accurately claimed that foundations were just propaganda tools for capitalists, saying that, quote, in the effort to undertake to be an all-pervading machinery for the molding of the minds of the people, in the constant industrial struggle for human betterment, foundations should be prohibited from exercising their functions either by law or regulation. Luckily though, in the end, the government didn't do anything, because why would they? From here, foundations began focusing on more big picture stuff. Instead of just covering up individual massacres, they would work on advocating for social and political causes. But this led to a new slew of criticisms, this time from conservatives like Congressman Wright Patman, who, correctly, pointed out that these foundations were just a way for the rich to avoid taxes and exert control on society. But their problem with this wasn't that it was bad in and of itself, but that these foundations were too progressive. For example, the Ford Foundation put a bunch of money into the civil rights movement, but even though they were doing that with the goal of steering the movement in a more conservative direction and away from all that anti-capitalism stuff, which they did, that was still too much for conservatives who, in a fumble for the ages, demanded that Congress more strictly regulate foundations to prevent tax dollars from funding left-wing movements. This resulted in two things. Regulations were put in place for foundations, taxing their investment incomes, limiting the types of businesses that they could engage in, and also requiring them to spend a whole 6% of their money on 
actually doing charity stuff. That was later reduced to five. It also led to the formation of right-wing organizations like the Heritage Foundation. Now, let's fast forward a bit. In Pakistan, most Christians are descendants of members of the lower castes who converted from Hinduism under British imperialism. Their extremely low socioeconomic status, combined with being a religious minority, has made them an easy target for discrimination, which only got worse when, with the full support of the Reagan administration, General Mohammad Zia al Haq performed a coup and installed himself as a military dictator in 1977. Christian Pakistani children are often trapped into bonded labor, supposedly working to repay a loan they or their parents took out, but a lot of the time having to work indefinitely because, like, they can't read and the factory has guards, so what are they going to do? One such child laborer was Iqbal Masih who was sent to work in a carpet factory at the age of four to help pay off his family's debt, which amounted to about 12 American dollars. After several attempts, Iqbal escaped when he was 10. He got an education and became an activist, fighting to end child slavery in Pakistan and anywhere else. In 1995, he was assassinated by, and I wish there was a less silly name for these people, the Carpet Mafia. Hitmen who worked for the carpet factories, killing or capturing any escaped slaves. Iqbal's death became international news, and in a suburb of Toronto, it caught the attention of a 12-year-old boy named Craig Kielberg. Craig wasn't particularly interested in foreign events at the time, since he was busy being 12, but that story stood out. This boy was his age. The next day, he gave a presentation to his classmates and rallied them to do what they could to get involved. They started a club called Free the Children to raise funds to help kids in poorer countries. Soon, this spread to other schools, and Craig's older brother Mark got involved. Free the Children became a large grassroots movement and was unbelievably successful, especially considering that for a very long time, it was literally run by children. Like, the brothers converted their family home into office space while their parents moved out to make room for their tween son's startup. It's a normal household, but at the same time, not every household has 50 young people running through it for a barbecue and preparing for a conference dealing with the elimination of child labor. So it's the normal household where you have the fun, the, the studying for homework, the young people coming for pizza parties. At the same time, you have the other side of it, where it's, it's an office. It's where Pray the Children is run. This is a very weird thing about Craig, especially. He was an amazing public speaker just by the age of 12. I was also 12 years old at that point, and I had never heard about child labor. Child labor is wrong for a white, middle-class child in North America, then why is it any different for a girl in Thailand or a boy in Brazil? Something that he'd be asked a lot is if his parents had much or any involvement, or maybe even if he was being exploited, and he always said absolutely not. Craig, if I can just ask a question, obviously it's a cause that no one can question, but are you certain you're not being exploited by adults in any way? Could you run this campaign? Actually, I'm the founder of the organization Free the Children, so I've done it totally on my own will, and it's a completely youth-run organization. But this kid was holding press conferences and flying out to do paid speaking arrangements before hitting puberty. Like, they actually sued a magazine for defamation for saying that his mom was essentially acting as his manager. I don't know. In my opinion, it seems like it's very important to Craig that he tell this narrative where he did it all himself. But it just paints this very strange picture of this little boss baby. Like, a big piece of lore is that Craig went on a solo trip through South Asia meeting with charities he could partner with and tagging along on sweatshop raids. While on his trip, he found out that the Prime Minister Jean Chrétien was in Delhi at the same time as him, and so, to get his attention, Craig staged an impromptu press conference outside of his hotel. 
Here's how he describes it in his unbelievably satanic book, We Economy, where he and Mark tell their stories and just give business advice based on their model. If you're curious what kind of advice they give, the fact that the book's cover is a heart made of money might give you some clues. Here's Craig. The next day, we found two dozen senior political reporters curious about a Canadian kid who claimed to have something important to say. They looked every bit like journalists with flip pads and equipment weighing them down. I spoke briefly, then introduced the child slaves that I had met during my travels. Mohan, a nine-year-old boy, had been working 12-hour days in a carpet factory since the age of five. He told the press about going without food or bathroom breaks. He was often beaten for falling asleep on the job. Another boy, Nagashir, could barely speak from injury. He wasn't sure when he was sold into slavery at the factory, but he imagined he was around seven. Then 14, he told the story of an attempted escape, not for himself, but for his younger brother. They were both caught and badly beaten. Nagashir was branded with a hot iron. He lifted his arms and turned his neck to reveal the scars from where the iron had cinched his throat, making his speech painful and difficult. It wasn't until a few days later, on the next stop in my travels in Karachi, Pakistan, when I learned that our impromptu news conference had caused a major stir, both with the Prime Minister and my mom. Already upset with me for not calling enough, mom was shocked to see me at the top of every Canadian newscast and even CNN. The press conference got Chrétien's attention, but also the attention of the international media. A short documentary was made about him, he was then interviewed on 60 Minutes, and began touring the world giving talks and important conferences, and meeting with people like the Dalai Lama, the Pope, and most important of all, Oprah. As you can probably imagine, this kind of attention and career made Craig into a pretty weird kid. Here's how he describes it in his own words. As a teen, I could quote conversations I'd had with world leaders at global forums or development seminars, but I couldn't name a popular song or an Oscar-nominated movie. My classmates went on about a show called Dawson's Creek, which was exactly like our lives. I watched one episode, it wasn't. I was oblivious to conventional teen angst, being so busy with We Charity, formerly Free the Children. Balancing a financial statement was more familiar to me than my math textbook. I fired my first employee before I ever broke up with a girl. Looking back, it was like living in a made-for-TV coming-of-age movie, a childhood adventure story about traveling to 50 countries before reaching adulthood, following a personal passion for a social cause, and learning from some of the world's greatest mentors while my friends and I built a charity. That doesn't sound like a coming-of-age movie, dude. That sounds like a rejected pitch written by a guy who fired his first employee before breaking up with a girl. The We Charity became a massive phenomenon, with campaigns that kids all across Canada, America, and England participated in. Their operations expand to include volunteer trips to other countries that they were operating in, as well as hosting huge events called We Days with celebrity speakers and performers. One thing that's also worth mentioning here is that this expansion in Wii's operations also involved growing their staff well past a bunch of teens inexplicably living in a house together. There have been widespread allegations of mistreatment and underpayment of their staff, who they'd guilt into working ridiculous hours for terrible pay by reminding them that they were working for a charity and that not accepting these horrible conditions was selfish. Basically like how your mom would say, finish your vegetables, starving children in Africa would love to eat those, except it's about labor exploitation. Trip leaders would allegedly have to pay we for their training with no guarantees of getting a job, while shared living accommodations were provided by we, creating what some former employees have described as a cult environment. It was allegedly common at We Day for staff to be on the verge of passing out from exhaustion, which sounds bad, but don't worry, we had doctors on site who would treat exhaustion by allegedly injecting people in the ass with something that would get them moving again. The We Charity has confirmed that they had holistic medics on site, but won't say what it was that they were injecting people with. 
But there were some subtler issues with Wii Day 2. When they were advertised, the messaging was on how exclusive they were and that the kids needed to earn their admission. Amazing. Cara, Alicia Keys. Oh, what a lineup. Oh, so much guys, fun. I found you. How are you doing? Gonzo, you're here. Well, of course I'm here at Wee Day. Where else would I be? But Gonzo, you realize you have to earn your way to Wee Day. I have just got to find a way to get in here. Oh, Seth Rogen, how you doing? Good, how are you, Gonzo? Oh, great. Listen, is it true you have to earn your way into Wee Day? Yes, that is accurate. It's a little weird for a charity to be using MLM sales techniques, right? Now, to be fair, I can understand wanting to really motivate kids to work hard, especially when it's for a good cause. I mean, we can all agree that Alec Baldwin's always be closing speech from Glen Gary Glen Ross should replace Hamlet on high school English curriculums. But also, past a certain point, how much money high school students are able to raise isn't really a matter of work ethic so much as just how rich of an area their school is in. And so it feels kind of weird for a children's charity to just kind of exclude poorer kids like that. Also, Wee Days have only been held in major cities like Toronto, Montreal, Kitchener, Winnipeg, Vancouver, London, that's London, England, not London, Ontario, New York, Minneapolis, and LA. Students from out of town were expected to get there themselves, which basically meant no one in rural areas could go to them. But also, they definitely weren't throwing events like these in Kenya or any of the other countries that they are building schools in. Like, I understand that there are a lot of reasons why it wouldn't make sense to do that, but if your corporate culture is one where you need to give your employees mystery injections just to keep them on their feet and then shame anyone who complains by saying that like, we have so much and the children in Kenya have so little, maybe you could scale back the budgets of your massive concerts and pay your workers a bit better or just use that money to build more schools. To understand why this is, let's look into some of Wii's other programs in Canada. Thanks to the massive success of Wii Days and Wii Clubs, the charity was able to build very strong relationships with school boards across the country. They partnered with these schools to unroll a bunch of anti-bullying and mental health campaigns, as well as a program called Wii Schools, where they'd provide teaching aids and curriculums for teachers. One pretty wild thing about this was that through these curriculums, they were literally able to write themselves into students' textbooks. But there was something else going on with all of this too. The real money going into these programs wasn't coming from small donors, but major corporations. As Craig writes in We Economy, a corporation attaching itself to a cause or getting the endorsement of a charity can serve as an amazing ad campaign. Purpose sells. Purpose is a differentiator. If the thought of adding a social mission to your already established brand feels daunting, know that you don't have to do purpose or even find the cause all on your own. Working with partners for brand credibility is nothing new. Think back to the golden age of celebrity endorsement, which for me peaked somewhere between Pepsi and Britney Spears and Fabio and I Can't Believe It's Not Butter. Today, it might be a nonprofit partner that boosts your business instead of a pop star. Now, Despite comparing his charity to Britney Spears and Fabio, Craig is actually being uncharacteristically modest there. Partnering with We Charity meant brands were able to get something that even an endorsement from Fabio couldn't get them. The ability to advertise in schools. All those teaching aids and curriculums that taught what a hero Craig is came covered in corporate logos. And this didn't stop with their corporate sponsors either. We made sure that they were cashing in in some pretty sketchy ways too. They regularly talk about how they've disrupted the nonprofit industry through innovations, but like any company that says stuff like that, what they mean is that they found a way to get around regulations. <laughs> So the Wii Charity started the for-profit company me to wii to fund their charitable work, which is pretty standard for a lot of charities to do. What makes me to wii disruptive though, is that instead of being owned by the Wii Charity and therefore required to be pretty transparent about all their activities, 
MeToWe is just the Kielberger's own company, and the separation between the two is extremely unclear. <laughs> For an example of how this works in practice, when kids at a school do a fundraiser, they'll sell bracelets or something made by people in Kenya, then either donate the profits to WE, or maybe use them to fund a trip to volunteer building schools. What isn't made clear is that me to we is selling those bracelets to the kids for a profit. Likewise, those trips and the places visitors stay when volunteering are also owned and run by me to we again, for a profit. Now, the Kielbergers have argued that this isn't unique, plenty of charities do similar things, but if it's not that weird, it seems a little suspicious to me how very few people involved in these clubs seem to be aware of that situation. Lastly, the brands that we partners with are some of the most evil ones on the planet. Their top donors include Allstate Insurance, who, after being named the worst insurance company in America, partnered with WE, and thanks to them, they were now the insurance company whose CEO gave out money to kids. There's also Tech Resources, a mining company that's been knowingly contaminating the water in the Eli Valley in British Columbia for almost a decade and counting. But now, they're the company that donates zinc to poorer countries whenever kids recycle batteries. Also, that is by far their most convoluted campaign. So the idea is that a disposable battery contains enough zinc to treat six kids who are deficient in it. And so, in reality, what they were doing was encouraging kids to recycle batteries, and then tech donated money to we to treat zinc deficiencies for each battery. But like, the messaging really made it sound like they were just feeding kids batteries. Another of we's major sponsors was none other than Dow Chemical, best known for manufacturing pesticides and also napalm and Agent Orange. At an event in Midwin, Craig brought Dow's former CEO, Andrew Laveris, out to a crowd of cheering teenagers. Uh, Laveris had recently stepped down from being CEO to become head of Trump's American Manufacturing Council, where he was working to get the Trump administration to ignore studies on the harms of the pesticides that Dow produces. And last, but certainly not least, we have Hershey's Chocolate, which uses child slaves to farm their cocoa beans. This is obviously the most egregious one of all for a charity supposedly fighting child labor to support. When the news of this first broke, we denied that this ad campaign existed, but like, you know how an ad campaign's whole point is to get people to notice it, right? So people were like, yes it does. Now while that obviously isn't great, we Charity isn't unique in this. Corporate donations are just a fact of how nonprofits are funded, and Craig makes what seems like a pretty fair case for them by saying this. When we launched, we worked with some great grassroots organizations, but it was more about incremental rather than system change. We realized if we wanted to create big change, we'd need to know more about the root causes rather than the symptoms of the broken system. The things that would make a real difference long term. Like, we definitely crosses the line very regularly about which businesses that they work with, but I can definitely see the logic where Having a big impact in tackling those big systemic issues requires a lot of resources. And so I can understand the perspective of a nonprofit saying that even if a company that's giving them money isn't 100% ethical, they feel that the good that they're able to do with that money outweighs any good PR that they give to the company. I can, in a sense, absolutely respect that argument, but as is the case with almost anything Craig Kielberger says, it's worth asking, is that really true? I think the phrasing he uses in that quote is really interesting because on just a sheer logistical numbers basis, he's obviously right. Like if your goal is to, for example, vaccinate kids in poorer countries, then yeah, more money means more vaccines. But Craig says that the reason they need all that money isn't to expand the scale of their operations, but to tackle the root causes of a broken system. And 
things become a bit more complicated there. In the anthropologist Jason Hickel's book, The Divide, he talks about his experience working for an NGO and the limitations they have. World Vision had hired me to help analyze why their development efforts in Swaziland were not living up to their promise. The reason, I discovered, was that their interventions were missing the point. World Vision went about caring for dying AIDS patients, setting up income generation schemes for the unemployed, teaching new techniques to farmers, and paying for children's education. But as helpful as these projects were, they did nothing to address the actual causes of the problems. Why were AIDS patients dying? Over time, I learned that it had to do with the fact that pharmaceutical companies refused to allow Swaziland to import generic versions of patented life-saving medicines, keeping prices way out of reach. Why were farmers unable to make a living off of the land? I discovered that it was related to the subsidized foods that were flooding in from the US and the EU, which undercut local agriculture. And why was the government unable to provide basic social services? Because it was buried under a pile of foreign debt and had been forced by Western banks to cut social spending in order to prioritize repayment. These findings troubled me, but when I pointed them out to one of World Vision's managers, I was told that they were too political. It wasn't World Vision's job to think about things like pharmaceutical patents or international trade rules or debt. If we started to raise those issues, I was told, we would lose our funding before the year was out. After all, the global system of patents, trade, and debt was what made some of our donors rich enough to give to charity in the first place. While charitable organizations do lots of great stuff, whenever you start to look deeper into, as Craig put it, the root causes, what you tend to find are things that aren't likely to make the donor class happy. In order to keep their funding, charities are required to remain apolitical, but the causes of global poverty are political, and unless that can be addressed, then the best a charity can hope to do is provide a really, really big band-aid. Also, if you can't acknowledge the causes of poverty, you run the risk of naturalizing it. These places are just naturally like that for no real reason, but don't worry, we're here to fix it. And nowhere is this effect more clear than on those volunteer trips that I've mentioned. Also, just like, while I've been holding up we as an example, none of this is unique to them. These are problems that exist throughout the entire nonprofit industry. That said, some of the stuff that allegedly happened, particularly in Kenya, is actual supervillain shit and very much not like any other charities. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be talking about that until my next video. Uh, sorry everyone, it's a surprise cliffhanger. Um, wanted to make this into one video, but there's a lot of ground to cover here and I just ran out of time and also didn't want to make a thing that's like two hours. Um, next video is coming in like two weeks and I think it'll be good. I'm going to be talking about voluntourism as well as just some of the frankly cartoonish crimes that the We Charity has been alleged to have committed. See you in two weeks and thanks for watching.
This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Click the link in the description or go to surfshark.deal slash we're in hell to get 85% off of Surfshark for two years plus an additional three months for free.